I'm from Operation Nightingale, Richard Osgood, and Dickie will go on afterwards and talk about statistics. We've been talking a bit about community. What you tend not to want from your community is that it's armed. Um, however, the guys that we've been working with have been through pretty traumatic experiences. Um, going back 30 years, we worked with um, serving personnel who were still in the British military and actually from militaries of other nations and also veterans going back to conflicts like the Falklands. Now the images you see there, um, top left is the road to Basra from the first Gulf War. Below it I think is from Afghanistan and the image on the right is from the Falklands conflict. Some of you may recognise HMS Sheffield which is the first of the British ships that was hit in 1982. And we've had veterans from all of those particular engagements and I'd defy anyone to go through that and not have some sort of personal legacy. Our community has worked on projects um, across the MOD estate and beyond. I'm an archaeologist with the Ministry of Defence, so I've got um, a responsibility for the heritage on that estate with my team. That's about 1% of the UK mainland. There's a lot of heritage there. It's about 770 scheduled monuments, last count, and part of 10 World Heritage Sites. I've got, a, therefore, um, a big portfolio to undertake work upon, um, and with the best will in the world, my budget's not huge. So having the ability to bring these people in to work on heritage projects is, is fantastic. Um, coming from all manner of backgrounds, all manner of interests, most of them are self-selecting in being interested in heritage and history and archaeology in some way or other. So we've got a, um, a demographic that is interested in heritage, having been on these landscapes from a very different point of view in their military careers. So guys here, actually I think all of these images are Salisbury Plain, apart from the one in the centre in the middle which is at um, a site in France. And they come with a very interesting um, story themselves, the participants, which will give you perhaps a unique insight into the elements there they're dealing with. Now, the chap you see um, lying down in the middle, in the um, central image, he's working away on a boot and that boot has got a foot in it. It's a First World War site. It's a British pattern boot with a foot in it. That um, small amount of human remains was recovered by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, who will rebury it in the local cemetery, um, but did tell us that the individual who lost that foot may not have been killed, so it won't have a burial of an unknown soldier of the Great War. And we were able to respond, well, we know that it may not have killed that person because the guy digging it has only got one foot and indeed one eye, and that's a result of an IED explosion. So when your archaeologists have an insight and an empathy with the actual components they're working with, it is really quite a strange paradigm. I'm just going to give you a couple of brief um, case studies that we've worked on in the last year or so. We've been working since 2011. We've got a lot of um, sites we've, we've built up. I've got a few current archaeologies I want to get rid of. I don't want to take them home, so if you want to grab one afterwards, please do. These are the ones in the last couple of years, and I'm going to hand over to, to Dickie to say how we've evaluated this work, or how Breaking Ground Heritage has evaluated it, and the knowledge that we've gained as to what works and what doesn't. Um, exercise Magwitch, we like to give the guys a bit of a, a cultural experience as we go along. Um, so linking with the um, eponymous convict from the prison ship in um, in the Charles Dickens uh, work rate expectations. So he's on the, the prison hulk. This was a project we have on a little island called Borough Island, known colloquially in Gosport as Rat Island, because there are bodies exposed there of convicts, possibly on the ships of the 19th century. And in the storms of 2014, we did indeed get a phone call from the local police to say that there were human remains on the island, and it's normally an urban myth when you get that story, you go down and it's a cow pelvis or something like that. But no, I was presented with an evidence bag with a human skull in it, it definitely was human. Um, and all those little holes you can see on the cliff face on the edge of the, the island there had the remains of human beings in them. Now we're wanting to work out whether they were um, from the prison hulks or whether they were um, perhaps prisoners of war and the other local stories. If you were captured in the Napoleonic period, you were put into um, a local holding area. The other ranks tended to be put on prison hulks. The officers were put on parole in the local villages. And if you go to the villages in Hampshire, which has, of course, got the big naval base of Portsmouth, you will find gravestones of 
um, French prisoners and their families that even came over from France and lived in the local village on the uh, officers' assumption that they wouldn't try and escape. Um, we took our guys after the storm had emerged, uh, had uh, uh, revealed several of these bodies to have a look and see what was there on the foreshore. And indeed, there were bodies put into um, wooden coffins. And here's one of them with the really rather obvious and fairly fund uh, fundamentally poor craniotomy that's been uh, undertaken upon this. Pre the Anatomy Act, this very also pre the 1832 Anatomy Act. Uh, therefore, this is a sort of site that is enabling rudimentary surgery to be practiced and give people a bit of bit more uh, experience with cadavers. Now you might think having traumatized individuals working with human remains is not necessarily a good thing, but they all want to. That's something they all really are interested and keen on. We make them undergo a kind of forensics training beforehand. Cranford University Forensic Institute provide this. Um, and it's one of those things we want to make sure that everyone has a um, a different job to do and will set their own parameters within that. We want them to work from the, the desktop assessment right through to the, the field work itself, then to be involved in the post-excavation, doing any x-rays of artefacts we find, um, and then to disseminate as well, so help write the article. So making sure that these individuals have the complete um, heritage, the gamut of, of experience that they can. So here's our, um, our individual. We wanted to try and demonstrate the sorts of things you can you can do with these uh, items, these artifacts, these people. And so we gave this particular one to Face Lab, a Liverpool John Moore University. And we're able to show the individual becoming a person again. And that's the key thing for me, is that connecting with people, um, be it the people that are working on these sites through to the, the elements they're dealing with. It all relates to the people. And I think that's what engages our guys. And I think Renzo was talking about that discovery moment. That's certainly crucial for our guys that they, they want to make discoveries. Some of them may be frustrated metal detectorists, um, but they want to find out about people in the past on landscapes that they've, they've worked with. So that was the Portsmouth site. Um, we went over to France. We've been there for a few years now to work on the, a site of a, of a tank battle. Again, one of these things, counterintuitive perhaps to take traumatized soldiers that have been um, gained their trauma through conflict zones to take him back to one of the more horrific conflicts that's ever existed on the planet, um, with the high likelihood of finding human remains and unexploded ordnance. Um, but again, something that seems to work. So we took them to a site of Bulacor. This is part of the, um, the Battle of Arras in 1917, takes place in April, with a tank attack with Australian infantry on the 11th of April 1917. Not like doing prehistory, you've got a date, you've got a couple of minutes in it. Right. Um, so we've done an exposed area here. We've cut through various sondages through what are shell craters on a, an absolute moonscape in that part of the battle. Uh, we put a, a team together which has um, an interesting narrative of well. This, this image you see here has a German veteran at the front. It has a Frenchman at the back. It has a Brit in the blue T-shirt and there were Australians as well. So we brought back the, um, the nationalities that were there in 1917 a hundred years on to, to retell that story. And they're excavating a shell crater. And within that, um, we found, I love that, the Haynes Manual of Tanks, brilliant. Um, all sorts of facets connected with a large lump of metal that was destroyed on the 11th of April, 17. It's a 28 ton vehicle. We found about a ton of it, but that's something that's really engaging because my team, Dickie's team, have a tribal narrative. This is part of their story, fundamentally, that military history that they really engage with. So finding things that may be horrific lumps of rust um, to, to, to other people are things that they can directly connect to and bring their own stories to. And again, you have the potential of finding human remains at all times when you're working on these particular sites. So this is the, um, the skull of a German soldier. He's a Prussian, found in a shell crater beneath the tank track that we excavated. And taking it back to the sort of sepia-toned image. We're seeing all this in colour, actually finding the paint of the tank track and things like this, but this is the sort of image of a soldier. Um, the guys that we were having working on this body were, it was a real feeling of reverence because this individual, this German soldier, had gone through the experiences that our team on site had as well. Um, and that was a, an incredibly powerful thing to experience as an archaeologist who's never gone through a military experience and never wants to go through a military experience. Um, but to see that dynamic 
is quite something. But um, that's the archaeology. But what about the assessment? Um, the key thing is having a framework in which this sits and evaluating what works, what doesn't work, um, or even if it does work. So here's to Dickie now. Cheers, Rich. Um, so like Rich said, my role in this is to find the veterans um, and bring them along and try and find out what really works, what doesn't work, and try and understand how it's working. Um, and one of the things we've identified is that although we have people with mental and physical uh, physical injuries, the vast majority, probably 99% of people, have got a physical, um, sorry, a mental uh, impairment of some sort, whether that be social anxiety, depression, um, PTSD, it doesn't matter, there is some sort of mental health issue there. Um, um, after looking at the surveys that we've done and the, and the questionnaires we've given them, um, some of the some of the more um, recurring ones, what we see here. So, I mean, this translates equally to the civilian population as well. It's not just exclusively to the, um, to the veteran community. Things like intrusive thoughts, sleeplessness, memory problems, anger issues, hypervigilance, restlessness, nightmares, self-imposed isolation, concentration, mm -hmm. lack of motivation, imminent flash to bang. That is, and we've all experienced it, when you're in your car, someone cuts you off and your immediate reaction is to kick your door open and go and beat the shit out of whoever it is. Okay, it's that instantaneous, it's just like that. Um, and the burdensomeness, um, the, the sense of being a burden to, um, to yourself, to your family, to society, to your people. So, as Richard said, what we do is we, we use archaeology and heritage as a way of bringing a like-minded community together. So there's a question asked to Karen earlier on about um, does, how, how can you prove that archaeology is helping these people or enabling them? Well, to, to a degree, we, we can prove that heritage for us and archaeology is, is, is enabling this because these people, as Rich said, are self-selecting. These are people that probably wouldn't have got involved in heritage or archaeology and wouldn't have ended up on these projects. So they've self-selected on the basis that they know they're going to do something historical and something archaeological. So to that end, I think you can say um, heritage and archaeology is 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 um, is enabling these people and it's providing experience. But then it's it's understanding the group itself um, and and how the group works. And so some of the stuff um, Rich has uh, gone through there. So things like um, research projects, excavations, um, building projects. We built a two-thirds replica of a tank which we was looking from Bulko, um, training modules with the guys. Um, and we do all this in order to provide respite, promote recovery pathways, and signpost and employment education. But the key factor in all this is that mantra, do no harm. As long as we're not doing anything wrong and causing anybody to walk away a bit more shaken than they came, then that's a good thing in our books. So why archaeology and heritage? As I've said, um, people are coming um, because they're interested in it. Um, archaeology provides these regimented routines, so you know that if you're digging a trench, there's a certain process you have to go through. You have to record it in a certain way. You have to report it in a certain way. Um, and the veterans understand this. It's part of being in the military. You get up at this time. You go for your ship shower shave. You go for your breakfast. You go and do your first parade. There's a set routine of what you're doing. Um, and also, like like I said earlier, time team. We all grew up on time team. Um, so most of the people that come on our projects know more about archaeology. Or they know the basics of archaeology, um, so it's nothing new to them. So they have got that basic understanding. And like Rich said, taking veterans back to um, the firing line, like Bulcourt, doesn't come without its dangers. Um, so look, okay. This chap here, um, he is an ex tank regiment guy. He was in Iraq, I think it was, um, driving his tank, and the tank in front of him got hit with an IED. <laughs> Uh, made a huge mess on the inside, uh, which resulted in him giving, give, getting given a plastic bag with a few body parts in it and said, there you go, when you go back, take that with you. Obviously, it didn't do him any great um, favours. Um, he subsequently left the military, um, a lot of issues, and he came onto this site in Bulko. Um, and when we found the tank track, it was brilliant, six foot of tank track, it was great. He was in his element. He absolutely loved it. When we lifted the tank track up and then found these guys underneath, it was, it was the worst thing that could have happened. He associated the tank track with these two bodies, which were totally separate, and it took him back to being in, in Iraq. Okay? So straight away, that, that manager of do no harm, it, it, it kind of didn't quite work, right, uh, work out there. 
However, having the right mental health support in place and the right procedures in place, we was able to pick him up, take him away, have a cup of tea, um, and by the end of that evening, he was um, back at the Sallow Trench um, and excavating that day, I think, that evening, wasn't it? Um, and we speak to him afterwards, and he said, yeah, it wasn't comfortable, it wasn't great for him, but he was able to speak to these skeletons as if it was his mate that had lost, and he was able to have that closure, or part of that closure, and it kind of... It, 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 it prompted him to start confronting some of these demons, um, which he's otherwise pushing to the back. Um, I, so, how it works. Um, Karen Burnell is in some great stuff, um, a research, uh, research psychologist at Southern University. Um, she's been um, looking at veterans um, since the First World War, the Second World War, the Falklands, um, Korea, really great stuff. And what she's seen is she's seen that as a veteran or um, as a um, serving member um, of the forces, when you come back from tour, um, you don't speak to your family about your experiences because you don't want to scare them um, and you don't want to give them the trauma that you've had yourself. Okay, So uh, she calls it a buffer. Okay, You're you creating that buffer. Um, what we do is we have like-minded people coming on projects, all got the same experiences. So we have our peer network. It's a peer support network. Um, we've all got an intimate knowledge of what the other guy's done, okay? And what we do is we can sit on a campfire and we can just have a chat. It doesn't matter whether I'm talking to someone who's in the Falklands or whether it's someone in the Second World War, okay? We've got that basic understanding. And um, we're able to talk stuff. Um, and we then become the, the engagers. So we're able to engage each other um, and talk about these things. The problem with a buffer is the buffer doesn't let you vent any of your um, frustrations. It doesn't let you um, process any of your problems. Um, so by me not talking to my family, um, I'm keeping this inside, and my family's on the fence hooks, not wanting to upset me. So if a war film comes on, we'll turn it off. If um, something uncomfortable happens, they'll divert the subject. So you're not engaging with it. So while you think you're doing no harm, actually there is evidence to suggest that there probably is a little bit of harm getting done there because you're not able to process this stuff. So by these guys, by getting these guys engaged with the local community, with a peer support network, you're really starting to get them talking again. Uh, and it's talking that um, they, they really need to do. Um, and this bottom point here, we have guys coming on the projects, um, and I'll have met them two or three days previously. We'll be having a cup of tea or a, a beer on, around the campfire in the evening, and they'll vent and vent and vent, and they'll say, do you know what, that's the first time I've ever told anyone that. And you think, yeah, that's great. Hey, hang on a minute, you've been in therapy for two years. I mean, why haven't you got this out with your therapist yet? Um, and and it, it's building that, that confidence, that rapport, whatever it is, but th th there is something missing here, and it, this is what we're trying to look at now within, within BGH, of how we can record this information in a way that is um, suitable to be able to then pass on to their medical training responsibility to, to really um, open this dialogue. Um, and again, this is just a peer support network. So it reminds me of our commonalities. It promotes the banter, that black humour that is not accepted in archaeology. It's fine, but if you look at any other... Um, profession it's not good to talk about some of the, the stuff we talk about and um, the cohesion some of these people have been isolated whether it be self-imposed or what they've been really isolated and it brings them back in um, it provides a collective identity again so rather than just being that weird guy in the pub I am now a veteran I am a soldier the mutual respect and then this, this, this all-important peer network and it's to help with the reconciliation okay so all these narratives that you've got going on it helps with the, recon uh, the reconciliation Um, there's, there's this theory that's going on here. Um, a guy called um, Andrew Castro um, in America, a research psychologist. Um, really great work, and I've been thinking quite about, a lot about this just lately. Um, so he says, in the veteran community, there's three factors to suicide um, for, for a, um, a serving person or a veteran. A strong perception that the individual's a burden to others, a high sense of, uh, a high sense of not belonging or isolation, and an acquired ability to enact lethal self-harm. Uh, self now, it's already given that if you're a veteran, you can commit lethal harm. Okay, that, that's given. So you've got two factors here. Um, you're a burden to others and a high sense of not belonging. We're going to already see here that self-imposed isolation and burdensomeness are quite high on, on what the guys are reporting. So straight away, um, straight away you can see that um, there is no safety mechanism, uh, mechanism now. Um, you've got all the right um, circumstances there for suicide. 
Uh, and so this is this plays quite um, high with me at the minute. I had to bury a, f- a friend on Thursday. Um, really nice guy, probably one of the best friends I've ever met. Um, everything was great. His life was great, um, and he decided to hang himself. Um, so this really is um, an interesting one, and it's really it really needs more work. And while we've been sat here today, um, I've seen on, on Facebook that um, there's been another guy kill himself. So this is happening on on a weekly basis, if not daily basis, depending on how we, how, um, how well it gets reported. Um, so this is a huge problem, uh, and the way we're looking at kind of identifying um, how we can um, mitigate this or bring it down. Um, so looking at self-declared feelings of isolation and being valued, um, by bringing people onto our projects, um, we can see that just by doing some basic questionnaires, so asking them, um, do you feel um, isolated? Not at all, occasionally, sometimes, most of the time, always. This, so the, these two questions for me aren't particularly great because for me, occasionally and sometimes, sometimes means the same thing. So there's a bit of there's, there's a bit of work that needs to be done there. But you can see people are, are coming on the projects um, are showing high degrees of isolation um, and um, high degrees of uh, sorry lower degrees of being valued um, before they come on the projects. And when they leave, um, isolation <coughs> is reduced. Um, and also feelings of being valued is increased. Okay, so straight away, that, that suicide factor, if you subscribe to that, you're saying, yeah, okay, we can say we are looking to do something, okay? That's why we're on the projects. When they go back to real life after the project finishes, they have to pay bills, they have to be alone again, they have to be the weird guy in the pub, things change again, okay? But while we're on the project, we can see that we are making a bit of a difference. Um, so this is just some of the projects we've done. Um, when we have people come on a project, if you're on a project for a week, okay, we'll, we'll, uh, for at least a week, we will ask you to do some surveys. So these are all psychological scales. We use a GAD7 anxiety, um, which will record anxiety levels. So you can see a pre-project and post-project, people reporting an, uh, a, 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 a huge reduction in anxiety um, after spending a week on a project. Okay, so you've gone from severe to, to moderately severe and um, through to moderate and mild. Okay, so we can see there is a distinct shift there. This is out of, um, I think it's 48 participants. This, so this is just this, this year. Um, look at PHQ8, which is depression. You have PHQ9, which looks asks the question about um, suicide. Now, we're not in a position to be able to do anything um, with that yet. So if somebody reports as being suicidal, it opens up a whole new set of avenues that we have to go down, which we're not capable of doing. So they developed the PHQ-8 for, for projects like ours. Okay, so the PHQ-8 is looking at people with depression, and again, you can see uh, you can see that people <coughs> leaving the projects have got a lower level of depression than, than when they started. Um, on this project, you can't leave without depression, hugely because of working with them. Okay, everybody gets depression working with Rich. But on this particular scale, there is no avenue, uh, there is no um, scale for no depression. Okay, so you will leave with depression. Um, and the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale. <coughs> Uh, and again, so this, this is a, a brilliant skill looking at the individual's mental health. Um, and, and we can see on this one that people are reporting low mental health, or the vast majority of people are reporting low mental health um, on the start of the project. Um, and then as the project progresses, they do the, the mental health does decrease. Now, I've already said that life happens. We're not, we don't work in a bubble. So life does happen on these projects. So we've had people that have been taken to the cleaners um, by the partner and during a project. So... The fact that they're actually leaving the project not in tears is a, is a, is a start, um, but we can see it is actually it is doing something for, for their well-being. Um, and what we've identified now is that we do our service on the last day of the project, and it's probably given as a false um, a false reading here because on the last two or three days of these projects, people's well-being does decrease, um, and we know this because everybody we speak to says. I feel really shit today because I know I'm going home. Um, so maybe if anybody's looking at doing these surveys, if you do your surveys maybe three or four days before the end of the project, if you've got time, you might find you get a different result and it's something we're going to look at next year um, on these projects. Um, so how do we move forward then? So it's the delivery of more heritage-based projects and there's something we're looking at now with external partners, um, external projects, um, and, and the, the key thing with this, it's, well, it's like any community-based project, it's engaging people with exciting, engaging projects, okay? If you give them, if you take them to a commercial site and say, 
dig that ditch and there's absolutely nothing in there, they'll come back and especially if it's raining, they'll go, this is shit. I mean, what am I doing here? I don't, I'm not coming back here again. So you have to find something engaging. And these two chimps found the sword. Um, so that was engaging for them. And you probably saw them on Digging for Britain on two episodes um, this season. Um, promoting well-being through best practice in archaeology. Um, so the archaeology cannot suffer for what we're doing. Uh, yeah, we might have some guys are having a bad time. But the bottom line is we've got the archaeologists to deal with the archaeology. And if, they're, if they are having a bad time, that's my job. I'll deal with that. And make sure we'll deal with the archaeology to make sure that the archaeology doesn't suffer. Um, we need to promote this as a viable and sustainable delivery method. Uh, if you can do that, you're brilliant. Okay. Again, we've already seen now that the funding for community archaeology isn't there at the minute. Or there's nothing sustainable. So it's about how we go, um, how we move forward, and, and prove this is a sustainable method. Um, we need to look at more um, social prescribing, so through GPs, through mental health society, uh, through mental health um, charities, um, however it be. But the social prescribing element, um, I think, it is, is key, especially for community groups. Um, and then look into how we incorporate all this with the individuals on recovery programme. So it's okay doing this project and then they're not going back. Uh, so it's okay doing all this great work with these people, for them to go there back home and sit on, sit on their arses and their hands and not tell anybody what they've done within, them, within their recovery chain. It's important that what they've done and all these surveys that they've done, the scales that they've done, gets fed back somehow into their... Um, the um, recovery management, the GP, whatever, so they can actually see, okay, before there was on the project, that was that, the presenter like this now, okay, how do we follow this up? Is this worth, does this person need intervention? What's going on? So it, it's about how we look forward to, uh, to the deliver that. And we're just talking with the Defence Medical Welfare, the, the Defence Medical Welfare Association, uh, I think it's called, um, about how we can link in with the, the military aspects of this and, and how we can really push this forward. Anything else? Nope. Brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs>